IndyCar starts up this weekend and you absolutely need to be watching it. Despite all the turmoil that's going around IndyCar right now between Michael Andretti and Penske Entertainment, IndyCar remains the diamond in the rough, as Michael Andretti said. It's the best kept secret in motorsport. It might be the best championship out there from top to bottom. The parity is unmatched, of course they use a spec chassis, but there are two different engine manufacturers, and their season kicks off this weekend in St. Petersburg, the Florida one, not Vlad's one, in Russia. It's always a really good race. Last year, we saw a great battle between Roman Grosjean, F1's favorite burnout, and Scott McLaughlin, everybody's favorite favorite Kiwi. And the two of them got together and Scott put him into the wall and you know, ultimately ended the races. Pato Award inherits the lead. Then his plenum decides to backfire on itself, kills the engine for half a second. He hands the lead over to Marcus Erickson, who goes on to win the race. We also had Benjamin Peterson try to establish the Canadian Space Agency when he sent Devlin DeFrancesco into orbit on lap one. St. Pete always delivers. It's one of the best opening rounds of any championship across the world. And you should tune in. Noon on Sunday, NBC, that's East Coast time in America, tune in and give it a chance because top to bottom, like I said, there's tons of personality in IndyCar. And if you're tired of hearing Sky Sports hype up a pass for 13th place, like it's Alonzo going around the outside of Schumacher and Suzuka, tune into IndyCar because this race last year had 128 passes for position. And this race alone, that's a quarter of the season in Formula One, if not more. This race always delivers, and IndyCar always continues to deliver. They have 17 different rounds, 18 if you count their new weird million-dollar all-star race at that ultra-rich thermal club in California, but 17 rounds mixed across street circuits, purpose-built road courses, ovals, everything that you could possibly want. And, of course, it's capped with the Indianapolis 500 on Memorial Day weekend in May, which is the crown jewel of crown jewels. If you've never been, definitely go. Join 325,000 of your closest friends. Just go ahead and try to get there early. But IndyCar remains one of the best series in the world. And I can't stress that enough. Sure, they're using a chassis that debuted in 2012, and it's now 2024. And for you people doing the math, that's 12 years, which means that it does qualify for some historic racing. And they'll continue to use it until at least 2027. That doesn't matter, though, because the racing is still superb. Uh, we've seen better racing on, you know, maybe at Indianapolis, right? The run that we had from 2012 until 2017 will absolutely forever go unmatched, more than likely. But the racing at the Speedway is still fantastic, and the racing on the road courses is still really, really good. Every single weekend when you show up to an uh, IndyCar race, you have the possibility of 10 guys potentially being able to win the race, like, just on speed. When's the last time you showed up at a Formula One race and you were like, oh, there's more than three people here that could probably win on speed alone? That's been a long time. Really long time, actually. Maybe you can count four in 2021, but even at that, we knew that at least two of those guys weren't going to be the ones that more than likely got the win. And IndyCar... Anybody can get the win, seemingly. Of course, you have full course yellows that get mixed in and they can kind of jumble things up. You have... Uh, a pretty liberal use of the red flag now, which we saw in the Indianapolis 500 last year. Don't love that. Multiple different strategies, two different tire compounds, two different engine manufacturers as well. Multiple powerhouse teams. And sure, Andretti, Ganassi, and Penske have won eh, basically every championship in the last 15 years. But you have Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, who's continually trying to get better. You have McLaren, you know, the same Formula One McLaren. Zach Brown's still doing the same nonsense over here, just like he is in Formula One, just handing out contracts left and right, trying to get as many people as he can. You have them. They went winless last year. Pretty embarrassing for a team that's putting as much money into this program as they are. But they're back again this year with a, well, at least two drivers that I think are, you know, talented enough. And Malukas, we'll have to wait and see what happens here. He's, of course, out for the first two rounds of the season with a broken wrist. He went all Lance Stroll and decided to crash his mountain bike and clack, clack that wrist right there. But overall, you have a bunch of really good teams. And then you have your small teams, too. You have your Dale Coyne, who literally just announced his driver lineup five days before the opening round of the season because he's Dale Coyne and he can do what he wants. If you've ever had Sunny Barbecue, that's him. You also have AJ Foyt, who continues to show up year after year. They have a new relationship with Penske this year, which could see them potentially get better. I mean, last year at the Indianapolis 500, we had 88-year-old AJ Foyt leaning over the wall to grab tires during Santino Ferrucci's pit stop. He wanted that win so bad. Ferrucci ended up third and was crying at the end of the race because he just wanted to give AJ an Indy 500 win. And honestly, it would have been one of the more popular wins in the history of the Indianapolis 500. AJ Foyt going back to victory lane at 88 years old with a kid that everybody had written off and 
by all accounts, Antuna Ferrucci was kind of a, a bit of a D-bag when he was a younger kid, but seemingly now he seems to be all right. We can accept him for, for what he is currently, uh, maybe not back in the day when he was trying to climb that F1 ladder. Regardless, it's great to see people like that. AJ Foyt still out there, still wanting it so badly. And of course, like I mentioned, we have a pretty diverse schedule in IndyCar. You have street races. You have the Long Beach Grand Prix. You have the streets of Detroit moved off of Belle Isle into downtown Detroit. Don't love the layout, but it's there. The streets of Nashville, which technically doesn't exist anymore because they shifted over to the Super Speedway 40 minutes outside of um, Nashville. Don't love it, but they're there. You have short ovals. You have Iowa. You have Milwaukee. You have Indianapolis. Of course, Indianapolis 500. We lost Texas this year. That's a bit of a bummer. Then you have your purpose-built road courses. Road America, Mid-Ohio. And then you're going to Barber. You're going to so many great racetracks around the country. Laguna Seca. It's one of the best championships. It's a diverse schedule. You're going all over the country. You're going from the Pacific Northwest, California. You're going to the South in Alabama. You're going up to Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. You're running in St. Louis at Gateway. You, of course, got Indianapolis, the Indianapolis Grand Prix on the road course at the Speedway as well. There's just a lot of really good things happening in IndyCar, and unfortunately, they just don't promote themselves enough, which is really unfortunate. So this year, a few of the storylines that we have to follow are Alex Pillow is back with Ganassi. After saying he was going to leave to go to McLaren in the hopes of landing a Formula One drive, which was never going to happen, he quickly realized that and said, nah, I'm going to stay at Ganassi because they're going to pay me a lot of money and I'm winning championships. And Alex Pillow right now is the gold standard in IndyCar. So he's going for his third championship. You also have Scott Dixon, who's been sitting on six championships. He's going for his seventh this year. Can somebody knock off the big three? Can McLaren hop up? Can Ray Hall Letterman and Christian Lungard come up. Can Graham Rahal get back to the top step of the podium? I don't think so, but he had some really, really good runs last year, and it's a pretty compelling thing to watch. Marco Andretti is going to show back up at the Speedway for the 500, and his one-off like he does every year, can he sit on pole again? Can he win the race and break that Andretti curse? One that his grandfather started after his win in 1969, and then Marco should have won in 2006, and somehow Sam Hornish gets this a uh, Herculean run on the last lap and is able to pass him at the line. Everything about IndyCar is so fun, and it's unfortunate that they're just not better at promoting themselves. And then, of course, you have Elio Castroneves on his drive for five this year to try to be the first person to win five Indianapolis 500s. You have across the board, it's just a great driver lineup. You have a bunch of Swedes in the series now. Can Marcus Erickson continue his success going over to Andretti this year? Can Colton Herta make that step up and become the IndyCar star that everybody knows that he can be? Well, Kyle Kirkwood take that spot from him as a inner team battle that's going on here. Can Hunko's Hollinger Racing get out of their own way? No, probably not, because they have now have Roman Grosjean and Augustine Canapino, and the two of them will more than likely run into each other if Augustine can find his way towards the front or mid-pack at any point this season. There's just a lot of good things happening in IndyCar, and I wish they promoted themselves better, but definitely give it a shot. Noon on Sunday, NBC, season starts off, and then they're heading to Thermal, and then they take basically like a one-month break. It's really unfortunate how spaced out this series is, but it's one of the best out there. So tune in, like and subscribe to this channel, follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.